Uh, at assembly, we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out what we're trying to do. <laughs> uh, you know, hepatitis B is very complicated, as we've heard to all throughout today. There are many different approaches to try to get to cure, but we really wanted to step back and let's just try to analyze a little bit what, what the problem truly is here. Because at the end of the day, it is a viral infection. So what I want to do is spend a little time of that, just give you an overview of that and, and give you some of the more recent data that we have. All right, uh, this, again, safe harbor statement as we have to give. What is poorly really appreciated is this slide. This is a, a study sponsored by Gilead on tenofovir. It followed tenofovir treatment for five years, all right? And this was a surprise to me when I first saw it, because I didn't really believe it, given the potency of a drug like entecovir, that you can treat, this is from year two to year five, analyze all these patients that are on multi-year treatment and look for PCR detectable, right, target detectable, and find 70 to 80% of patients, despite five years of treatment, still have detectable virus. Virology 101 is we will never cure a virus infection if the virus is still there. The virus is simply going to reinfect when you take the drug away. So it should be no surprise that, that you get reinfection or when you take the drug away, the virus comes back because there's a lot of virus still there. Just dropping S also is not a, let me go back for a second, uh, with, with we, you know, We took these drugs and we, when we, when we launched these drugs in 2005, 2006, Tecavir and Tenofovir in particular, the standard of that day detection was such that every patient, pretty much, unless you had lamivudine treatment first, went undetectable. All right? When we launched these drugs, we really thought these were going to be very powerful antivirals and work like every other antiviral. You treat long enough, you will get rid of the virus. And so when we left these patients, 48 weeks, pretty much everybody's undetectable. Right? What is the issue? The assumption was, as we do with most antivirals, when we go into that zone that we can no longer detect it, we consolidate and it keeps going down. The surprise was it doesn't keep going down. As you can see, there's very little gain for four more years of treatment than where we started at year two. Now, just dropping S down, I know people really love S. Uh, just dropping S antigen alone is, I don't believe, is going to actually lead to cure by itself. Clearly, we have to stimulate something or have something added. Simply because, there, there's, and there's an example of patients, there's a range of patients that have been treated for a long time for different, different uh, therapies. They have very, very low S antigen. Okay, uh, as you can see, less than 10 ICs per ml. But they all have detectable virus, and this is why they're not cured. There's no seroconversion. So the immune system is not just coming back in, and we're going to clear out these patients once we get S down. So we do believe that cure is not possible if the infection persists. So there's a low-level infection. The reason why nukes don't continue to go down is scientifically unknown. I have no explanation. I've worked on Tecavir for 12 years. <laughs> I can tell you, you know everything about that drug. There is no reason why that drug does not go down to undetectability, true undetectability. Why do the nukes stop? We don't know. But the fact is they do. And this is what makes hepatitis B unique. So again, to remind you, the steps that we're talking about with nukes, they do block one step. And that's encapsidated pgRNA conversion to DNA is the step that the nukes work, OK? Single-stranded RNA to double-stranded DNA. And so they block the release of virus that has DNA. They have no effect on the infection of a cell, the generation of CCC DNA. <coughs> Core inhibitors um, have multiple effects, as we've already heard from Jason. Most importantly, they block encapsidation of pgRNA. If you do not encapsidate pgRNA, you cannot convert it to double-stranded DNA. And therefore, the downstream steps of release of virus, they're really good antivirals. But we weren't really looking for just an antiviral, because we saw what nukes did. What we were looking for is something that not only had antiviral activity, but had an ability to stop CCC DNA generation, okay? Because that's the key Achilles heel, if you will, for hepatitis B infection. And what these core inhibitors do, what we found, and we've developed a lot of assays to analyze this, is that they actually will pre-melt the incoming nucleocapsid before it can get to the nucleus and deliver the DNA, be converted to DNA. And it's very, very effective at concentrations that are the same as the antiviral activity. This can easily be demonstrated in just standard assays, uh, which makes life a bit easier. If you just look at Entecavir, for instance, and you do our standard assays, but here you measure not just viral DNA, which is shown in green at the bottom, but you look at the three surrogate markers of CCC DNA, E antigen, S antigen, and pgRNA. Uh, we, we love S also, but we also love all the transcripts, if you will, the proteins that come off of uh, CCC DNA. We want to see them all go down. 
And as you can see with Entecavir, as potent as that drug is, and as you can see, there's no titration. You're down to 0 0.001 micromolar, okay, a nanomolar. It's less than a nanomolar, you still almost get 100% inhibition of DNA. But as you can see, going 10,000 times higher, we still have minimal effect on those markers of CCC DNA. Again, serine has no effect on CCC DNA. If you compare that with the core inhibitors, the green line, again, not quite as potent as Entecavir is. I don't think we're going to find an antiviral that does that. But what's important is all the lines go down in parallel, not just viral DNA, but all the surrogate markers of, of CCC DNA. So when you take this, and what does this mean, bottom line? Core inhibitors are actually better antivirals than, than the nukes are, especially in hepatitis B. And we had this finding where, you know, we've done thousands of these assays at assembly now, that the dark blue line is in Tecavir. We always use it as a control, and we always get this kind of graph, okay? And, and for most of us, we would never even notice the subtlety I'm going to tell you. Those blue circles or that blue line never goes down to zero, okay? We always see this, we just don't understand, it's like an artifact of the assay, but the core inhibitors always do go down, and clearly the combination goes down. If you blow that up, instead of doing percent inhibition as we would normally do, and try to understand this in greater detail, we find these cell culture assays actually mimic what we see in patients, all right? That no matter how much entecavir you add, again, 10,000 times higher concentration, that dark blue line never quite gets all the way down, whereas core inhibitors do. And matter of fact, core inhibitors don't even quite get all the way down, but the combination of the two gets in our hands to a point where PCR undetectability can be achieved. So we're very hopeful that the combination of entecavir or a nuke and a core inhibitor is going to get us far more suppressed than we ever were. And if we can truly shut down this virus, good things have to happen. So how do we do this? Okay, at Assembly, we've, we've really focused, as you know, most, of us, most people know, we've really focused on, on these core inhibitors. We truly believe in them, and we don't believe we have everything we need, perhaps, but we do want to be the company that has the best core inhibitor. And so we have a pipeline of these. Our first one is 731. It is currently in phase two studies, and I'll go over that in a second. Uh, our second compound, second generation, and I'm gonna show you the, the real key of second generation. The 731, the J&J &J compound, Roche, all these compounds are really first generation. These second generations are, are 10 to 50 times more potent than the first compounds. Our second one, 2158, just started its phase one study this year. And I'm happy to announce that we just recently announced our third compound, 3733, which actually even has more potency than 2158, but maintains all the other properties. These are all from distinct chemical series. They're not analogs of each other. They each have different properties because they're distinct chemical uh, platforms. So the 731, I'm not gonna spend too much time on. There is a presentation on Sunday um, that you can hear the, the final report, if you will, on the 1B study, a 28-day study. But I just wanna point out this one slide uh, of a preview of the most important data. I think, uh, first of all, in a 28-day monotherapy, phase 1B study, the standard in hepatitis B, and E antigen positives in particular, we get a 2.9 log drop, a mean uh, maximum drop of 2.9. That is as high as anybody's ever gotten, or as, down, as further down as anybody has gotten with any inhibitor, including the nukes. The nukes in Tecavir is 2.8, Tenofovir 2.7, TAF 2.6. So 2.9 is sort of a benchmark now, three logs and e-antigen positives. Overall, we get about 2.8 logs across e-antigen positives and negatives. But the distinguishing feature of core inhibitors, because they do uh, have this different kind of mechanism than nukes, and unlike nukes, you also get the blue line, which is a two log drop in, in pgRNA, or RNA, viral RNA. So again, something you do not see with, with the nukes. All right, all the details will be presented at that presentation, so I'm not gonna go over that one anymore. What I wanna go on is, is just how we're going to try to prove what I've just told you. So we envision, in the studies we've designed, that there are four components to actually demonstrating this proof of concept. The first is we have to eliminate the viral load, not just down to where the nukes go, down to PCR, target undetectable. And we have to have an inhibitor, or an inhibitor in that con or some kind of way within that regimen that we block CCC DNA formation. Once we get down and shut down the new synthesis of CCC DNA, we can then decay away the existing CCC DNA pools or infected cells, because no one has shown that core inhibitors can actually eliminate existing CCC DNA, so we have to wait this out. 
are studies that we've done at assembly, and we've done a lot of work on this with clinical samples. We believe that that CCC DNA turns over in 12 to 16 weeks. And whether it's a CCC DNA or the infected cell, doesn't matter to us. The time frame to flip that entire thing over is 12 to 16 weeks. We also expect that during that time when you shut it down, we should see the surrogate markers of CCC DNA going down because it's being eliminated. Then we go into the blind zone, right? Whenever we get down to that point of everything being down to a very low level or undetectable, we have to just do the consolidation time of at least six months because, we, again, we don't want to make the mistake we made with nukes that we got down but not down far enough. And then finally, if you take patients off of therapy, you see if there's a relapse, all right, which is the simplest, best definition of a cure. <laughs> you stop, you have infected, you're treated, and you take away the treatment, the virus does not come back. So here's how we've done these studies, and these studies are ongoing, and we hope to report the initial data at EASL, as we saw our, our plan. So to do the first one, the elimination of viral load, we've done a study called 202. It takes naive patients, the engine positives. We either treat them with Intecavir standard of care or Intecavir plus 731. We go for six months, and the gold is there. Can you go down faster and deeper than you can with Intecavir alone? We think that's a pretty obvious thing that we should be able to prove, but, but clearly the study is to do that. The second study is to go to deal with the second part in, in, uh, in parallel, and that is start with patients that are already suppressed on nukes, a very, very low level, add, let them stay on the nuke, whatever they're on, just add the core inhibitor on top for six months, and see if you can get that remaining DNA down to undetectable, and then see, because it's now undetectable, whether you start to see decreases in uh, all the surrogate markers of CCC DNA. But the studies are not finished, even though they're six-month studies. They will switch to a new number, open-label study, and that's the green, okay? That's the consolidation time. We don't know how long it takes, and that's why it's a blur between that and taking them off. Each patient will be uh, response, ge response generated in terms of, uh, response guided, excuse me, in terms of when we take them off after consolidation period. That could be from six to 12 months. It's open-label. Everybody in these studies, regardless of the arm they're on, goes to open-label nuke plus, uh, 731. Okay. So not stopping there because at the end of the day, if that works, okay, if that works, it's going to be about how much better can you do and how much faster can you do it, right? We're trying not to have a multi-year kind of study, but can you do something in 12 to 18 months? To do that, you're going to need a, a compound that's as potent as possible to knock it down. And so the second generation compounds I talked about, I pick your favorite assay. Uh, the most important two are the bottom two. PHH, we find the primary human hepatocyte assay is the most predictive and the most relevant. And it also screens out for compounds that get metabolic, metabolized excuse me, in the liver. As you can see, we get very, very good activity. We're now down to double digit nanomolar in assays that uh, predict surrogate markers of CCC DNA. Again, different chemical platforms. The, First generation compounds, such as 731, are in that two to five micromolar range. So again, we've almost had a tenfold decrease each time, not quite. The most impressive data is this data, and most important for us, because it's good to have antiviral activity, but we need to see that it hits CCC DNA. And so this one, you can see we just titrate very similar to what Jason showed you. Titrate down the effect on CCC DNA itself. And we've now gone, we've moved the needle in these southern blots from micromolar activity down to, as you can see, with our new compound, 3733, down to 300, uh, 334 is the EC50 now to take out CCC DNA. So we think these compounds are going to be very, very important. We don't know what kind of potency level you actually are going to need, but we do believe the combination of a core inhibitor and a nuke is going to get us to a better place than we were with just a nuke alone. So let me just complete now and finish up with to cure. We do believe you have to eliminate the virus in CCC DNA. We think core inhibitors are highly effective antivirals. They're, they're designed in a way to disrupt viral replication at multiple steps, and a critical one in particular, knocking out the generation of CCC DNA. 731, our first candidate, which does have, have fast track designation by the FDA, has very favorable safety. Matter of fact, it's been in over 150 patients now, and a very, very clean, actually, safety profile. Great PK, 24-hour half-life, QD dosing, no accumulation, very nice compound to work with clinically. Activity is, again, as good as anybody's in a 28-day study. The 300 milligram dose is the dose we've selected to go forward, and as I mentioned, uh, results should come out uh, at, at the time of easel. 
For 2158 and 3733, uh, these have enhanced potency. They retain the favorable drug-like properties of 731. They're potent inhibitors of CCC DNA generation. 2158, again, phase one study has started, and 3733 is in its IND enabling studies. So we believe that a more rapid and deeper reduction uh, will help really eradicate the virus if we can, deplete the CCC DNA levels, and hopefully move the needle on, on cure to something beyond the couple percent that we see today. Thank you very much.